you want to, you can, I suppose you could turn to, I'm trying to think of a good starting place. I'm going to do part two in the sermons I've been doing on Pentecostalism. Um, it's going to be a longer series, and as we go forth, you'll see more and more, I believe, the more sermons of these you hear and listen to, I believe you'll you'll learn, and you'll, you, I believe most people that listen to these will have a, a growing uh, conviction as to why the Pentecostal movement is a dangerous thing. And, you know, I gave the first sermon, and I talked about how uh, you have to understand when you start talking about how people are wrong or something's heretical, a lot of times people see it as unloving or something like that. But in reality, I love Pentecostal people. I love people that are in churches that may not be teaching the truth. And because I love them, I want to teach good doctrine that will go out and reach them on the Internet. And I also want to teach good doctrine to people that attend this church that way that we can reach them in real life. And if we don't see their doctrine as abhorrent and wrong, if we don't understand the truth, then we can never reach them with the truth. And then you have people just running around with false teaching and bizarre beliefs. Uh, the Pentecostal movement is a very uh, new thing. It began in the early 1900s. And I talked about all this uh, before. I'm just going to kind of recap some of it and then get us back to where I was last time. The Pentecostal movement is a rather new thing. It started in the early 1900s. Uh, at something called Azusa Street. A lot of people don't know, what's Azusa Street? What is all this kind of stuff? And Charles Parham and all these you know, weird characters that come out of that. Well, suffice it to say, the very first supposed outbreaking of the working of the Holy Spirit, uh, which I would call it back then an unholy spirit, because it was not of God, was a bunch of people rolling around on the floor, uh, hiking their legs like dogs, uh, quote, treeing things is what they called it, treeing it. Like a dog hikes his leg on a tree. That's what people were doing inside of a church house. And they called that, hey, look, this is the outbreaking of the spirit. And it was really an unholy spirit. It really was a strange thing. And out of that came so much bizarre doctrine and fanciful beliefs. And it's merged into all these other different things. And it's just formed all these different denominations. You have the Assemblies of God. You have Pentecostal Church. You have United Pentecostals. You have... Uh, holiness churches, you have all these different denominations, you have snake handlers, I used to work with a dude who was a snake handler, didn't like to talk about it very much, but he was a snake handler, you have all these different denominations that have spurred from this bizarre movement of an unholy spirit in the early 1900s, and all these different beliefs, and I said before, and I'll say it again, there are good people in Pentecostal churches, they are, they're deceived, they might be shallow in their faith. They don't understand some things. They've been taught wrong, but they might be good people. There are some saved people in Pentecostal churches. They don't believe all the Pentecostal doctrine or they wouldn't be saved, but there are some saved people in Pentecostal churches. But I will say this because it is true and because we need to understand this in order to know who the mission field is. A lot of Pentecostal people are not saved. And as we go through this series, you're going to see why. It ain't going to be as evident in the first couple, but when we get to the one on losing salvation, that kind of thing, uh, or the doctrine of the Trinity, you're going to see why a lot of these holiness people, a lot of these oneness Pentecostals, they do not know the Lord. They deny the Trinity. They deny salvations by faith alone. They deny the core points of the gospel, and they know not the Lord. Now, this one here that we've been talking about in the first sermon I'm going to talk about in this one is not salvific. Okay, this isn't something, if you're wrong on this, and, oh, you're just unsaved. That's not what this is. But it is important. And if you remember last time I talked about the indwelling of the Spirit of God and whether or not getting the Spirit of God is always evidenced by speaking in tongues. And there's a lot of people that say, if you get the Spirit of God, you'll speak in tongues. Or they'll say, if you've never spoken tongues, you've never been indwelt by the Spirit of God. And so in the first one I talked about and, and kind of broke in uh, to this you know, topic and was showing, you know, why would they believe this? What kind of justification from Scripture do they give? And I went and I showed you how in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost and they spoke in tongues. And I went and I showed you how throughout the book of Acts, and if you remember this, I'll, I'll remind you if not, uh, 
In Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 41, you had 3,000 or more people saved. None of them are recorded as speaking in tongues. In Acts chapter 13, verse 48, no mention of tongues. Acts 16, 30 to 33, no mention of tongues. Acts 17, uh, verse 4, verse 12, verse 34, people getting saved, no mention of them speaking in tongues. And then Acts chapter 18, verse 8, there was no mention of anybody speaking in tongues. And I'll turn over to Ephesians 1 and read to you now a verse that is very important here because I, and I gave you the illustration. I met a woman on a bus one time when I was driving a bus and she said, have you ever spoken tongues? I said, no, I've never spoken in tongues. And she said, well, you need to get the spirit. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she basically was telling me that I don't have the spirit of God. And I told her, if I don't have the spirit of God, I'm not saved. And you say, well, Charles, why would you believe that? Ephesians 1 verse 12 says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the, that Holy Spirit of promise. After you believe, you're filled with the Holy Spirit of promise. Not after you speak in tongues, not at some subsequent event after you're saved, but the Bible teaches when you believe on Christ as your Savior, you're saved, you're justified before God, and you're filled with the Spirit of God. There are people out there in different denominations, like Lutherans or even some Presbyterians maybe, but Lutherans believe baptismal regeneration. You say, what does that mean? They believe that when you get baptized, you get the Spirit of God. Some Pentecostals believe that too, by the way. That's heretical. That's false. That's what Martin Luther believed. That's what Catholics believed. That's not what we believe. That's not what the Bible believes. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches after you believe, you're given the Holy Spirit. After you believe, you're indwelt by the Spirit of God. After you believe, you're given a new heart. You're regenerated. But these other false denominations and some false teaching out there says you have to have some secondary event. You know, you're a subpar Christian. You're a secondary Christian if you don't have this secondary event take place. You need some second action, some second working of the Spirit. And they'll say, unless you speak in tongues, you've probably never had that. I've talked to people from Pentecostal churches before, and they were very down about it. They would say, no, I've, I mean, I'll try to imitate basically. I've, ne I've never spoken in tongues, I'll, you know. The saint, I ain't saying God it, you know. And they're just like down like that. Like they just, a demeanor like they failed. Or like they're just, they've not attained it, you know. And that's what that's the way they described it to me. Like they didn't attain yet. They have not arrived yet. And so in a lot of these uh, charismatic type churches, they they think that you, you arrive at a spiritual high point when you speak in tongues. And trust me, there's a, I'm going to cover in the future the truth about tongues. The doctrine of tongues and speaking in tongues and all that. That's not what these sermons are. These sermons are just talking about this very bizarre teaching that there is this secondary feeling of the Holy Spirit subsequent or after salvation that Christians need to have. Um, people like John Piper, some well-known Calvinist, he actually was teaching that he believed in some secondary move of the Spirit of God on a believer that filled them uh, in a different way or something like that. Very strange. Uh, there's very strange teachings out there, but the Bible teaches after you believe, that is when you're filled with the Spirit of God. And I showed you in 2 Corinthians how Paul at the end of 2 Corinthians says, hey, test yourselves, see that you're in the faith, that Christ is in you, lest you be reprobate. If you're a Christian and Christ ain't in you, guess what? You're a false Christian. Because if you're a Christian, Christ is in you. That's what he was basically saying at the end of 2 Corinthians. That was in chapter 13, verse 5. So, and I went through, and I think I ended there last week in, 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 second, in 1 Corinthians 12. I showed how the Bible teaches, and I, I guess I'll go back there just as a refresher. Anytime you do a multi-part on the same topic, it's, it's hard to catch people up because I know during the week you're not always sitting there just thinking about everything I taught about or something, so... In 1 Corinthians 12, remember the chapter ended like this. I won't read the whole chapter again, but it did end this way. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 29. Are all apostles? 
And remember, all these have a clear and obvious answer. Is everybody an apostle? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Let's see. So it's rhetorical questions, right? And it says, watch this, are all workers of miracles? Well, now, now we're moving down the line, aren't we? You see, it started off with apostles, then it went to prophets, then it went to teachers, and now it's people that work miracles. And so you see there's been more people in history that's, that's been teachers, there's been more people in history that's been miracle workers than there was that was apostles or prophets. But still not everybody is. Does everybody have the gift of healing? Does everybody like Peter? When Peter would walk down the road and they said, get in his shadow, he'll heal us. No. Do all speak with tongues? See, the answer would be no. Do all interpret? No. And so for these Pentecostal people, charismatic people, and it's not all of them. You can't blanket all of them. This is, I'm just going to hit different teachings from different points of these different knowledge. And, and believe you me, like any given Pentecostal church will probably fit multiple of these sermons that I do. But, you know, it's not a blanket. Surely some people would say, I don't believe that, and they're Pentecostal. Sure, but the, the one down the road does. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and they're supposed to, by the way, um, at least most of these that I'll be doing on this. But, you know, do all speak with tongues? No. And so they'll say, well, you got to seek the gift. you got to seek it out, and maybe God will give it to you. But the Bible says everybody ain't going to do that. So here's the thing. If the only proof that getting the Spirit of God is speaking in tongues, and not everybody speaks in tongues, does it not obviously follow that not everybody's going to have the Spirit of God as a Christian? That's what you'd have to take from this. But hold on a second. Ephesians 1 said that the Holy Spirit is an earnest. It's a down payment. He is, he is our promise that we're going to heaven. So I guess most Christians just don't get that promise that they're going to heaven. You see how stupid this is? It's not good theology. It's not, it's not coherent. It makes no sense. And the only way you believe in these bizarre... You say, how does somebody come to believe that you know, you got to get the Spirit after salvation at some later point? How does somebody ever come up with that? Where did they get that from? It doesn't make any sense with the with the verses you're reading me, Charles. It doesn't make any sense when you think about 1 Corinthians 12 or Ephesians 1 or just biblical coherent theology about how when you're saved you get the Spirit. Where did they come up with this stuff at? Well, I want to show you that. And that's where I was getting ready to get to last time. See, there's a lot of scripture that makes it clear that when you believe on Christ, you're saved. When you believe on Christ, you're given the Spirit of God. But... And I, I wrote that up there for a reason. And I, we talked about that briefly in Sunday school this morning. There is this period of time right here. And I, I wrote it here. Think of it this way. You see that? It's, a, it's like an intersection. Okay? You have this period of time when the church, the church age is kind of clashing with or, there, you know, there's a change from the, the time of dealing with Israel to the time of dealing with the Gentiles and the church primarily and that that time brings with it a lot of confusion and a lot of hard verses to understand why does it say it that way why does it say it this way and that's what we're talking about with all of it discourse and whatnot well with that if you turn to the book of acts go to acts chapter 2 <clears throat> acts chapter 2 i'll let you get there What we're going to see here, and I'll, I'll read most of this first account just to show you kind of what we're going with and what, what I'll show you. But what we're going to see is Pentecostals, and this is true. By the way, how many books of the New Testament talk about tongues? You want to guess? Anybody want to guess? Three. One of them is at the very end of the book of Mark. One of them was in Corinthians where he basically re rebukes them for doing it wrong. And then you have the accounts of it in Acts. But did you know most churches, that's about all they talk about and about all they do? And that's very strange. Just going to throw it out there. If all you're talking about is tongues, and it's only in three books of the Bible, there's something wrong with you. Okay? But tongues is something that's easily exploitable because we don't have very much about it in the Bible. 
It's almost like marriage and divorce. You got some stuff about marriage and divorce in the Bible, but there's a lot we wish, you know, we had more because there's so many different scenarios with divorce and abandonment and stuff that people are like, well, what would God want me to do? And a lot of theologians and pastors have a hard time advising people because, quite honestly, there's not a lot there. You wish you had more in some regard, right? Well, when it comes to tongues, it's a lot like that. And what a lot of charismatic people do, they twist these doctrines, they come to the book of Acts, which is a book of history. You ever wonder why it's called Acts? You know, it's been given different names. Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Holy Spirit, some people call it. But, you know, Acts of the Apostles is what my Schofield Bible basically calls it. Acts of the Apostles. That's why it's called Acts. The book of what the Apostles did, right? The Charismatics come to a book that's telling you this is what happened. And they try to teach doctrine out of it. As if it's like an epistle telling you doctrine. You see, it's very it's not smart is what I'm showing you. It's, it takes a lot of discernment to do that. It's almost like when I was going through the Old Testament and we'll go through and I'll talk about how a king does good and he'll do bad and he'll say something right and he'll say something wrong. And you've got to have discernment to know that's right, that's wrong, this is what we're supposed to do, that wasn't supposed to. And sometimes it's hard to understand, right? In the book of Acts, it's just, it's just recording what happened. It ain't telling you why it happened. It's just telling you what happened. Sometimes it'll give you a why, like Peter stand up and say, hey, I was reading the Bible, we should replace Judah, Judas, you know, and, and they do. But a lot of times in Acts, it don't tell you why, it just tells you what. Well, the, the charismatic Pentecostal types, they'll come here and they'll go to Acts and say, we're getting our doctrine from here. And here's one of the places they do it. You say, how could somebody come up with this weird doctrine that you get the Holy Spirit way after salvation at some later time? And you get the Holy Spirit, it's going to always be manifest by tongues. Where would they come up with that from? Well, here's where they get it. I'm going to show you what this means for real and why it doesn't mean what they say it does. Look in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to start <clears throat> verse 4. I read this last week. Verse 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. So who are these people that's there? Jews, right? From every nation. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans, and how they heard uh, hear every uh, hear and how hear we? Sorry, every man in, in our own tongue, wherein we are we're bur are born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers from Rome and Jews and proselytes and, and what it's saying is we're from all over these different places. We have these different languages, and yet I hear them in my language. How does that happen? <coughs> what happened is, the Holy Spirit comes down, indwells the apostles and the believers there in, in the early church, and gives them the ability to preach about Jesus to all these people that had different languages. This shows us the gift of tongues is means the gift of languages you think about how you speak if i cut your tongue out what would happen you couldn't speak anymore right and that was a torture and a, and a bad thing you people would do back throughout history and even today you cut your tongue out and you couldn't talk no more right it's a hor horrifying thing to think about but guess what that's what the tongue would mean a language right so when the king james says tongue just understand it as language because that's what it means okay so when they were given different languages they spoke to all these different people with different languages that's why it says we do hear them speak in our tongues. It means, hey, they're speaking our languages. The wonderful works of God. That's talking about, I believe, the gospel. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking, saying these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, verse 14, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that, are, that dwell in Jerusalem, 
Be this done unto you and hearken to my words. And then we have the great sermon that Peter preached. You know, Peter, the leader of the apostles, essentially, goes and he preaches this sermon at Pentecost, exalting Jesus, uh, 3,000 people, you know, get saved. But here's my point from this, is the audience. Note the audience here. The audience is Jews. See, Peter says, ye men of what? Judea. And all that dwell at? Jerusalem, and you remember back in verse number uh, four and five, it said he says uh, it says the Holy Spirit gave them uh, the ability to speak in other languages to people dwelling at Jerusalem. There were Jews, devout men from every nation. So what had happened is at Pentecost it was like a big feast, right? It's like we have when Jack's here. Usually we would have like uh, we on Wednesday evenings, ever like once a month, we'd have like a a fellowship meal, and then we'd have a short Bible study. It's like, that's what the feast days were like on a big scale. Everybody would come around, and you'd have a big meal together. And you'd celebrate, and you'd worship. Well, that's what happened here in Jerusalem for Pentecost. All the people that believed in, in God, that were Jews back then, came together for Pentecost, and then this happened. So, were these people atheists? No. Were a lot of these people saved? Maybe. Maybe some of them were saved, maybe some of them wasn't. Maybe some of them were just given, you know, the nod to, to God of the Bible. But these were people who claimed to be Jews. They claimed to believe in God, the God of the Old Testament, right? So what did Peter do? He told them about the God of the New Testament, who's the same as the God of the Old Testament, but it's it's more revelation, right? It's, it's, it's a progressive revelation. He says, hey, this God you say you believe in, he sent his son to die for your sins. He died for your sins. He rose again. That's the gospel. Well, the audience is to Jews, okay? That's the first thing I want you to know. This is the first occurrence in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit comes upon people and they speak in tongues. So a charismatic comes here and says, see, they got the Spirit and they spoke in tongues. What are you going to do about that? See, proof. Go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, about verse 45. I just want to deal with this in simplicity so that if you ever ran into somebody who was confused on this that was actually sincere, let's say you had a friend, oh, I'm a Pentecostal, and they, and they start teaching you this weird stuff like, well, I just think, you know, later on you need to get the Spirit of God. And you said, well, why do you believe that? And they said, well, you got a Bible? Turn to the book of Acts chapter 10. And they said, look, I'm going to show you what you need to have happen to you. You know, and I had, by the way, I had this happen to me when I was... Um, working at the town one time, I had a guy come out. He was a mechanic at the time. And, you know, I didn't know much of the Bible yet. I was, you know, just now going to church for a while. I was just now reading my Bible. And he came out there one morning, and I was doing a pre-trip inspection for my truck and stuff. And he came out there, and he was like, he got a Bible, and he laid it there, and he did this. He just, he just poked it with his finger. And I said, what? It was really weird, you know. I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, right there. And I said, okay. And it was Acts chapter 2. And later on I found out he's like Pentecostal. So you know what he's getting at? He was like basically saying, you need to be indwelt by the Spirit of God. I mean, it's kind of weird, isn't it? But you see, that's the depth of the law they're teaching. It's like, man, you need this. I heard one guy said, I got the Holy, uh, the Holy Ghost, and I lost it. That's what he said. I got the Holy Ghost, and I lost him. You know, it's like the Old Testament times for these Pentecostals. Like, the Spirit, of God, the Spirit of God comes upon them, the Spirit of God leaves them. That's Old Testament doctrine, by the way. That, that happened in the Old Testament, and I didn't cover that yet, but I'll mention it here in brief. Do you realize that? The Bible says, He has been with you, He will be in you. Okay? That's what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament times, we talk about the times of Israel, he would come upon David. He would come upon Saul, right? He would come upon people, and he would lead people. Remember, the Holy Spirit had come upon Saul, and later on departed from him, and God sent a demon to torture Saul. That's biblical. I mean, that's a whole story in itself. That's a sermon or two in itself. But that's what happened with Saul. The Spirit of God in the Old Testament came upon people and left people. And he was with people, Jesus said. He has been with you. But he will be in you. 
So in the New Testament, it's not like, well, some of us have the Spirit of God, some of us don't, like Pentecostals teach. That's Old Testament doctrine. In the New Testament, everybody who's saved has the Spirit of God. And that, that, by the way, is getting ahead of myself to a degree, but it's key teaching because of what we're getting ready to see here. You know, there's a lot of confusion. Look in Acts 10, 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And watch what happens in verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then, uh, then, they, uh, then prayed they him to tarry there certain days. Now, who's this to? Who was the audience of the first one? The Jews, right? Everybody, all the Jews got together as at Passover, and the Jews were there. The Holy Spirit come down. They all spoke in tongues. Now we see, later on in the book of Acts, we see Gentiles getting saved. Right? It calls them Gentiles. It tells you the, there's a reason. There's not a word in the Bible there on accident. It's telling you the audience for a reason. The Gentiles get saved. They receive the Holy Spirit, and they speak in languages. Right? They're speaking in different languages to one another. And here's the thing. Like I said, if you were in conversation with somebody who was trying to prove the point to you, and they brought you here, what would you say? <clears throat> what if they said, hey, like that guy did to me. Hey, there it is. When they got the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. You know, what would you say? That's what I'm going to help you with. Acts 19. And you see, this is the problem when you get your doctrine from just kind of like historical record rather than uh, you know, an epistle that's actually dictating doctrine. You're just getting it from events. Hey, this event happened. Well, you better be careful getting your doctrine from the book of Acts, to be honest with you. Yeah, the book of Acts is profitable for doctrine. Don't get me wrong, but you got to be careful to do so. You better be diligent. You better study to show yourself approved when you go to narrative to find your doctrine. It's a lot easier to get doctrine out of Romans. It's a lot easier to get doctrine out of Ephesians. It's a lot easier to get doctrine out of Galatians or Corinthians or Philippians or Colossians or any of those books that are written in epistle form because Paul is dictating to people, this is the truth. This is the truth. Here's what's true. Here's what you do. But when you go and read a narrative, you better already know the truth so that you can interpret that right. And that's what's wrong with a lot of these Pentecostals. You say, well, why do they get it wrong? Because a lot of them ain't saved. That's the, that's the sad truth. Why would someone believe such warped and weird things? Because a lot of them ain't even saved to begin with. That's the sad reality of it. Look in Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? You see his doctrine already is forming? He's saying, hey, you, you've believed? Have you received the Holy Ghost then? Because his doctrine already, he's, he's wrapping his mind around it. He's saying, hey, when people believe, they get the Holy Spirit, right? Watch what they say, though. And they said unto him, We have not so, uh, so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So these people, they didn't even know the Holy Spirit existed. And you know what? If you read the Old Testament and you never read the New Testament, you might not understand the doctrine of the Trinity either. But you see, the Trinity is mainly a New Testament doctrine. You can find it in Old Testament once you know it. You can say, oh, look, in Genesis, I see, you know, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. I see that's the Holy Spirit there, right? You can see in Joshua, you can say, hey, that's Jesus standing there, right? You can see these places, the pre-incarnate Christ showing up or the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters. But if you just had the Old Testament... You wouldn't really understand the doctrine of the Trinity. That's basically where these people are at. They say, hey, I, we don't heard as whether they're being Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, under what then were you baptized? And they said, under John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. <coughs> 
And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, here's the thing. With prophecy, what does prophecy mean, by the way? It doesn't mean I'm just going to tell you the future. You know that? Prophecy is what I'm doing right now. Did you know that? That's, that's the truth. That's what prophecy means. To prophesy means to speak forth truth. That's all prophesying means. So they began to speak forth truth. They began to preach, basically. That's what preaching is, speaking forth truth, prophesying. It's all the same. The Bible says despise not prophecies. You don't need to get to the point where you hate preaching, okay? You, if you get to that point, there's something wrong with you. You better like preach. You should like somebody to preach. And by the way, that goes to the, to the message this evening a little bit. Um, but it's, that's another story. But you should like someone to preach what you should want to say. You want it like, yeah, yeah, I like what that preacher's saying. I agree with that, right? That's, that's what they're doing. They're prophesying. They're preaching the truth of God. After they get saved, they're like, yeah, and they're starting to speak in other languages. So here's the thing. Who are these people? What crowd is this? This is disciples of John the Baptist. And so I'll show you these three points because here's the thing. You have these three points in the book of Acts. And it, by the way, do a, do a search yourself for tongues in the book of Acts. It's only there like four or five times at most. I forget the number, but it's like a handful or less. And this right here is the main events where they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they speak in other languages. And so a Pentecostal, this is where their doctrine comes from. They say, see, it happened. Here it is. Acts 19. You tell me I'm wrong. I seen Billy Joe the other week get filled with the Spirit and he jiggled in the floor and got wrapped up in the microphone cord and foamed at the mouth and we threw a sheet over him and he laid there writhing in the floor and he got the Spirit. That's what happens in these places. I can show you videos of it. They writhe around the floor. <coughs> they act like heathens. They run up and down the, 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 the aisles jumping in the baptism, waving their, their, their jackets around. Is that of God? As we'll go through this study, we'll see it isn't. But what about this this idea of Billy Joe got the Spirit last week. He was saved for years, but he finally got the Spirit, and we know it. <coughs> we know he got the Spirit because he spoke in tongues. Like that guy showed me. There it is. What are you going to do about it? Well, let me give you what I think is going on here, and I think it's fairly obvious once you study it too. And I could actually go further and deeper into this in the Old Testament Um and I, I, there's, there's sermons I've heard in the past that did a good job of doing so. But there's this account in the Old Testament with Moses. And Moses has this, this point where he has to appoint a bunch of other people to help him do ministry. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God come upon them like it had him and helped Moses to do this ministry, right? And there's a place in the, in the King James that says, El dad and me dad doth prophesy. In the camp. There's these two dudes who they got the spirit of God. And they start preaching at people. And the people are like whoa what's going on. Moses is the only one that usually does this right. <coughs> and Moses basically is like hey. Would to God that everybody did this. Would to God that everybody had the spirit of God. That's what Moses said right. Well here's the thing. In the new covenant. In the new testament. That is true. That is true in the new testament. All people of God do have the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. It's not like the Old Covenant. It's not like the Old Testament times when the Spirit of God would come upon somebody and leave somebody. In the New Covenant, once we get into the church age, all Christians, all saved people get the Spirit of God. And that's what you're seeing happening here in the book of Acts. And if you do even further study, what you'll see is this. Uh, the Jerusalem Council, and there's these little... There's these little church uh, gatherings that wind up happening. And if you see here, um, let me see here. I'll actually, I'll actually just show it to you. <clears throat> I'm going to go go to Acts to see. I'll just go to Acts 10 again. be the easiest one to show you. In Acts 10, verse 47. Maybe you thought it was kind of strange that Peter said this. But think about what Peter said. He said, can any man forbid water? You know what he's saying? In the Old Testament times, did you know that there was an inner court for the Jews and the Gentiles had an outer court? 
the Gentiles were separated, right? <clears throat> Ephesians 2 says that in Christ, that wall that divided Jew and Gentile is broken down. And there's neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ, but all are one. Well, what's going on here is he's saying, these people are Gentiles, but they receive the Spirit of God just like us. So there's not level one Christian Jew, level two Christian Gentile, level three Christian John the Baptist, right? There's not multiple levels of Christians. We're all the same. We all have eternal life. We all have the Spirit of God. We're all saved by faith, right? We're all in one body. There's not levels of Christians. And what I, what I propose to you is happening in these different accounts is each one of these are getting their little mini Pentecost events to show unity. You have the disciples of John the Baptist, you have Gentiles, and you have the Jews. And what the book of Acts is showing is the same thing that happened to the Jews is the same thing that happened to the Gentiles is the same thing that happened to the disciples of John the Baptist. All of them were indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. None of them were second-rate Christians. None of them had different levels of this or levels of that. But instead, it shows the unifying event of the early church. The Jews, the Gentiles, and even the disciples of John the Baptist were brought on over. <clears throat> and what it's showing you is the transition into the church age. You see? It's showing you how all the believers of God, um, Cornelius, for example, was a God-fearing man. Cornelius, I believe, was probably saved. If, and I, can't, uh, I don't got time to get into that account, but if you know what I'm talking about, in the book of Acts, you got Cornelius. He was a God-fearing man. He said his alms had reached to God, but he didn't believe in Jesus yet. So what did God do? He sent Peter to him and brought him on over. You see? And that's what's happening. You're having these people, John the Baptist people, saved people, bring them on over. They, they need to hear about Jesus, right? You got people over here, God-fearing man. He believes in the God of the Old Testament. Bring him on over. Tell him about Jesus. So they're people that are saved, <coughs> but they're saved <coughs> without knowledge of necessarily all the New Testament theology. They need to hear about Jesus and the gospel. I mean, think about it like this. What if you lived in, you know, 1 BC? You know, you lived in 1 BC and you believed in God. You believed in the Old Testament. You went on a trip across the seas and you found yourself in the early Americas and you're over here with all the Indians and stuff and, you know, you never hear about Jesus coming and living and dying for your sins over there, right? Would you go to hell? W would you during that transition period? If you believed in God? I mean, that's, that's a theological dilemma that people saw. Now, here these days, let me, let me go ahead and solve this for you real quick. If you don't hear about Jesus today, you go to hell because the Bible says there's salvation in no other name, Right? But for that short period of time between, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament, when people heard about the God of the Old Testament and they believed in him, it's the same God of, of, you know, the Trinity. But what I'm saying is they don't know the progressive revelation. You know, you have, it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd point in time. And theologians wrestle over this. You know, how do you explain this? How do you explain that? Well, here, here that's what I'm showing you. God explains it to us. <clears throat> he shows, hey, if you're saved out there at this point in time, he sent a messenger to you to show you that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus did these things. Cornelius is an example of that. The disciples of John the Baptist are an example of that. God made for certain that saved people that were out there got news of Jesus and were brought on over into understanding the new covenant. And when they, when they heard that, they also got the Holy Spirit. And, and Peter and the apostles were witnesses of such a thing so that they would know, okay, they're just like us. They're not second-rate Christians, you know. They're not second-rate believers. They're just like us. They're fully indwelt by the Spirit of God. And so, <laughs> as I conclude here, my, vote, my, my, my throat's really scratchy, so I apologize. But as I conclude here, note this. And, and, and get how sinister this is. And the whole reason I'm doing this, I want to show you this point here. The Pentecostals and Charismatics that believe this, not all of them believe it, but some of them do. Maybe even most of them would believe it. The charismatics that say you got to speak in tongues to have the Spirit of God or you got to get the Spirit of God after you're saved at some point. What they inevitably are doing is they're creating multiple levels of Christians. You know, over here's one dude. He never speaks in tongues. He, he, he thinks he don't have the Spirit of God. 
But over here is this other guy. He acts like he's gibberishing every week. Everybody's like, oh, this guy over here is super spiritual. And this guy over here loves the Lord. He just feels like he ain't, he ain't worth nothing. Oh, man, you know, I wish I could speak in tongues. I wish I had the Spirit. No. That's creating second-level Christians. And do all speak in tongues? No. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? No. And so what the inevitable outcome is in a lot of these Pentecostal charismatic type churches that teach such a thing is you create Christians that are doubting their salvation or they're doubting their walk with God or they feel bad about their self or they feel like they're subpar and they're not, they're not meeting the mark. But what the book of Acts shows us is we're all one in Christ. We all get the Holy Spirit the same way. See, it's unifying us. But they take those very verses that show unity in Christ and create divisiveness. Do you see how evil that is? They take the very verses that the Holy Spirit inspired and put in there to show we're all one in Christ. We all have the same spirit. We're all on the same level as Christians. They take those verses and create divisiveness and say, you better get that secondary event. That's not what the Bible's teaching at all. And I'll go you know, later on in later sermons, I'll talk about some of the, the worst heresies. Because, you know, you could be wrong on this. Somebody could come to me and say, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe Jesus was buried and rose again. I believe that you're only saved by faith. And you know what? I believe you're saved if you believe that. And they can say, I believe that, but I also believe later on you get a second blessing. And you get some secondary. I, I say, you're wrong. That don't mean they're unsaved, though. But I'll tell you this. As we work our way through some of these different heresies that different, de, different Pentecostal denominations have, like Assemblies of God or uh, Holiness Churches, there's different beliefs they each have. Some of these Holiness Churches are the most heretical churches that I've ever known because they will teach work salvation. That don't mean that everybody there believes it, but that's what they stand for, right? And uh, some of them deny the Trinity. That's a different God. And so as I go through these different doctrines and show these things, we'll, we'll begin to see more and more how the movement's very dangerous. There's a reason I'm Baptist, right? And I'm not Pentecostal. There's a reason I'm Baptist, not Methodist. Uh, there is things that divide, and uh, the truth is naturally divisive. And I think that uh, some of this doctrine, you know, for good reason, needs to be gone over. And it's my intention to work through these different things and to show us what the Bible actually says about that. Hopefully that clears it up a little bit. I think the first sermon was more showing, hey, you get, you get the Holy Spirit at salvation, okay? You get the Holy Spirit when you believe. This sermon was more intended to show you, here's what they try to use. Look, people spoke in tongues and acts when they got the Holy Spirit. Okay, what's that supposed to mean? That just means that we all get the Holy Spirit. That's why it showed it at different points. They try to say every time you get the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. But guess what? In the first sermon, I showed how People got saved over and over again, didn't speak in tongues, you see? And so their doctrine's wrong. It's disproven by itself within the book of Acts. And um, it's, a, it's also very dangerous. It's dangerous to a Christian because, you know, you should love your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I don't want you to feel bad and think you're not on the same level as somebody else because you don't do something. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all, do all prophesy? No. Do all teach? No. But if you're a charismatic, I guess the answer to that might be yes.